All right. So welcome to this month. This is the month of June. Welcome to this month's uh, ELTS webinar on authenticity, building it in and building it up. My name is Michael Fields. I'm at the University of Delaware's English Language Institute. I want to welcome everyone. Uh, if you're joining, if you just joined, I just want to invite you to please send your name, send me your name in the chat, and I'm going to make sure that you get a certificate of attendance. We're going to do, if for those of you who have attended these before, we're going to be doing something, I'll try to do something a little bit different, which is that I want to make this more participatory. But let's go ahead and get started. And I want to thank um, ITEP, the International Test of English Proficiency, for sponsoring this webinar. And let's just take a moment to read this um, to read this text. And there's something very wrong with this text. This is oh, just a second. That was my dog. Never had that happen before. There's something very wrong. This is a this is part of a, a reading test, and there's something very wrong with this text. So if we can just take a minute to read this, and I'd like someone to tell me what the problem is. Anyone has an idea what the problem is? Any ideas? Um, she seems to be shy and does not engage with meaningful um, um, I don't know, activities where she can practice English? Uh, Moises, I'm sorry. You're, you're absolutely right, but that's not my question. I'm not asking about the problem described in the reading. I'm asking about, this is a, this is a, this is a section of a test, a reading test, and I'm asking as a test, what's a, what's a fundamental problem with this test? Uh, probably the number of the pictures are distracting. I, I'm sorry, that's my background. I just took, I just made a background that says what's wrong with this picture. The the text is only in the blue box. I'm just asking maybe, what's maybe, wrong with this picture. Sorry, so, maybe the source of uh, of the text. There is no source. Uh, who who is saying that? Is that? Is it? Yes, it's it's me. Okay, T go 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 farther with that, please. We don't know the, the source of the text. I mean, is it taken from a magazine or a newspaper or? Yeah, does it does it seem like a magazine to you? No, I'm, I'm just say the source of, uh, I, I, just to, to give an example. Is it from a diary, for example? If you want, for example, to, to use this text with, uh, with your students, you just have to mention the source of this text. So yeah, so. What what do what do you think the source is? It's not a diary. If it was a diary, it would say I. It wouldn't say Marie, right? It would say I. Yes. Probably, right? Probably uh, child literature. I, I mean, ch ch children's literature is pro probably not about this topic, right? So perhaps um, the text is not very authentic. Yeah, exactly. The problem is this doesn't really come from, you would never find this text anywhere. You would not find this in a magazine. You would not find this in a newspaper. You would not find it in a journal because it would not be written in third person, right? And exactly, right. that's exactly what we want to talk about today is this text has no authenticity. 
So it's not from anywhere. It's completely, completely created uh, for the purpose of giving a, a language test. And that's the only function that it could possibly have. Now, I'm not saying that that's completely a bad thing. And there are probably reasons for this uh, text. And if we look at how we, we keep seeing um, we keep seeing used to in different forms and we keep seeing the past tense and we keep seeing this, this theme of language learning. There's, there's probably a lot of con there's probably a lot of content validity in this text. So I'm not dismissing it outright, but I just wanted to use it as an example of a text with no authenticity. So let's go ahead and see what, what authenticity actually means. Authenticity essentially asks the question to what degree does material in a test recreate features that we're going to find in a non-testing situation? So let's think about how special we are as language teachers because nothing we do in the classroom has any, this is a very strange thing, I'm a language teacher too, right? So it's a very strange thing to say, but nothing we do in the classroom has any importance whatsoever except except to the degree that it demonstrates something that might be happening outside the classroom right so if we have students if we create exercises and students can do our exercises but it doesn't help them in any way to uh, use language outside the classroom then we really what we're doing has has no real point right has no real function so our goal as language teachers is to do things inside the classroom that are going to help students when they're not in the classroom. And so when we build authenticity in to our exercises, or in this case, what we wanna talk about today to our tests and assessments, this is a feature of language that we really want to build in. And we wanna think about two kinds of authenticity. We want to think about text authenticity, how much authenticity are in the, the text, the listening or the reading text that we see. And then we want to think about task authenticity or how much, how authentic are the tasks that we are giving students that they need to, where they need to produce language in speaking or in writing. And let's remember that no task, sorry, no test is completely authentic, right? because the test itself is not an authentic situation. So we, we cannot have a test that is 100% authentic. As soon as we bring someone into the classroom and say, here's a test already, it's not authentic. But what we would like to do is we would like to add authenticity to our tests to, to the degree that that's possible, All right? So let's go ahead and look at some, uh, there basically we can talk about four levels of authenticity. We can think about completely authentic texts. This is about text authenticity, right? We can think about completely authentic texts. We can think about modified authentic texts. We can think about constructed texts, and we can think about modified constructed texts. So completely authentic texts would be, would be where we just take a newspaper article, a website, you know, any written, any written form or any kind of recorded conversation, a clip, small clip from a TV program or a movie, anything like this, and we just present it to the student with no modification would be a completely authentic text. But we may have reasons to modify our authentic texts. So if it's an article, we may want to edit it for length, or we may want to simplify the vocabulary, we may want to simplify the, the grammar. Those would be examples where we start out with something authentic, but we simplify it or we edit for length would be examples of modified authentic texts. We might also want to modify it because the cultural references are unclear. If it's a recording of a conversation, we might want to re-record it for clarity. We might want to add in structures uh, or, or simplify vocabulary. We might want to take out parts we think are unnecessary. Or we might want to eliminate the kinds of repetitions that we encounter in uh, in natural speech, but we might not want to build into a test. So these would be uh, examples of authentic. And then we might start out with a completely constructed text, 
Completely constructed just means you wrote it, you're a teacher, you write it, and you use it as a test. That would be completely constructed. Or, or you write a conversation, you script a conversation, you write it, you record it, you give it to the students, that's completely constructed. But we can also modify those things by adding in elements of real world, natural language in order to make it more authentic. So even if we construct it, we can try to add in elements of authenticity to make it more authentic. And all, also just by contextualizing or making sure that the, the, the content is interesting and relevant, we're also making it more authentic. Um, let's talk now about task authenticity. And I wanna go through these things re relatively quickly. If you have any questions, please ask. But I wanna go through these pretty quickly so that we can get to the, the main part of our, our task today, which is to give you some practice. I wanna talk about task authenticity and that might occur in speaking or it might occur in writing. So in speaking, when we're asking students to produce language, do we, does the task allow your speaker to speak freely? This would be an example of building in authenticity. So if we're asking our students to only pronounce or just use isolated words or just read sentences in order to evaluate them, this is not authentic, right? But if we allow students to express themselves freely, to give their own point of view and their own knowledge, this would be an example of a more authentic type of speaking. And if we ask student, if we make the, the, the prompts more contextualized, more interesting, more relevant to the students' lives. This is also a way to build in authenticity. In writing, um, we want to ask the question, does the task allow the writer to complete a task that will be done outside the test? So is the writer writing something that, that's really relevant in, in the outside world? Like, is he writing an email? or an academic essay? Is he, is he writing a, a, a review of a product that he bought on Amazon, right? These would be examples of authentic tasks. Um, does the task conform to recognize genres? So does the, is, it a, is, it an, is it a business letter or is it an academic essay? Is it an email? These are like recognized genres in writing. And again, can the writer express his or own views or is he told what to say? And again, are the prompts contextualized or interesting or relevant? So these are the examples of task authenticity in speaking and writing. Um, let, let's turn now to reading. And I just want to, to think about if, you know, that the, the problem with that example that we saw in the beginning was we couldn't really identify where it might come from. It wasn't a magazine. It wasn't a journal. It wasn't a newspaper. It didn't seem to be really anything except an English test, right? So I think if we, if we want to think about what we call sometimes domains of reading, if we're gonna have any kind of reading, we should be able to say, well, where does this come from? And it might be something personal, like a letter, an email, a text message, a greeting card, a form to fill out, some kind of document, um, forms, right? Or it might be something public, like, something sign in a, in a shop window, street signs, maps, public announcements, leaflets, timetables, advertising, regulation, menus. These things are all example, newspapers, magazines. These are all examples of public documents that we read. We have two more levels, which are higher levels, which are the occupational, professional, and the educational. And those would be higher level um, reading tasks. So anything that you give to students to read, you should probably, if you want to, if you want it to be authentic, you should probably be able to identify which of these four domains, the personal, the public, the professional, or the educational, does it come from? Um, you may feel that, you may feel that, uh, you know, right now, having had this 10 minutes of conversation, you may feel like, well, boy, I better make all my text authentic. And actually, we, let's look at some advantages and disadvantages of authentic texts. We're not going to say that they're, they're great just because they're authentic. Each, each authentic or, or constructed has its advantages and disadvantages, right? So advantages of authentic texts, so there's 
obviously high levels of authenticity, which is, that's an advantage right there. If it's authentic, it's authentic. That's already an advantage, right? They're good for upper levels. They're easy to use as, as, as teachers, they're easy to use because you don't need to write anything. You just find it and it's, it's all right there for you, right? But again, it might be necessary to edit for length to simplify language. But there are also some disadvantages built in. So um, a high level of language might be difficult if you're not working with upper level students. It might contain unfamiliar cultural references. And it might just not contain those elements that you want to test, the kinds of elements that you want to test. So um, you might consider editing those authentic, modifying those authentic texts. And on the other hand, if you select texts, if you're going to, sorry, if you're going to construct texts, you're going to write them yourself. What are the advantages you can create a text with all the elements that you want to test, exactly the grammar that you want to test, the vocabulary you want to test, you can create it. Constructed tests, texts are often considered to be better for lower and intermediate level students. You can control the input according to your needs, right? But disadvantages would include that, well, they're not authentic. When you create them, they're just not authentic and they're, they're very time, concern, time consuming to create, right? So um, those are some of the disadvantages. If you are going to create or construct texts, again, just this tip, try to build in authentic elements, authentic features of language. Try to build those in as much as you can, right? And uh, I think one way to do that when you create, um, when you create texts is think about them being topic-based and not grammar-based. And that's, that's a lot, that goes a long way right there to um, creating authentic texts. All right. And you, you might say, well, what if, what if I have low level learners? What, how, can I have, how can I have authentic texts when my learners are low level? But here, just here on, on this slide, we see lots of examples of authentic texts at the lower level. You can just take a minute to look at some of those examples. Street signs, shop signs, notes, recipes, emails, regulations for a pool. These are all examples uh, that I pulled from authentic, all of them are authentic sources, yet we could use these at a lower level. All right. And now the fun begins. Uh, I hope all of you have access to the email where I invited you here. And you have a, a list of eight, or yeah, not a list, you have, you have eight documents. So what I'm going to do now, let's see, how many, let's see how many people we have. We have seven people. I'm gonna create three breakout rooms. And I'm going to give you, um, So there'll be two or three people in a room. And I'm gonna let you select together in your rooms, I'm going to let you select one of those um, uh, documents. So please choose one to work on as a group. And what I would like you to do is I would like you to take these authentic texts and decide as a group, what can I do with it? What, what, and, and think about how you might want to modify it. Would you simplify it? Would you shorten it? And if you're going to do that, what elements would you try to simplify? What elements would you try to modify? And then what would you test? So obviously these are all, these are all going to be reading tests. So I'm going to give you about 15 minutes to work with your groups, in your groups. Um, again, select one document and think about what what kind of what level of students would you use this text with? What how would you what would you be testing for? How would you modify if it's if it's very simple, you might not want to modify it. If it's more complex, you might want to modify it. How would you modify it? So I'm going to give you 15 minutes in your group, and when you come back, I would like one person from each group to be able to, be able to present their document 
and tell us what you did with it, what decisions you made, and how you would use this for a test. Does everybody understand? Okay, I'm gonna be right here. If you have any questions, you can call me to your breakout room. So let me go ahead and open the rooms. You've got 15 minutes and when we come back, we'll hear from you, all right? So Nina, can you join? All right, welcome back everyone. I think we lost Christopher Sanders. I, I don't know what, maybe he wasn't too interested in the collaboration. Um, does everyone know? I, I think everyone knows how to share your screen by this point, right? I, I hope so. Um, Kabe, let's begin with you. Why don't you share your screen and, and tell us, and your partner can jump in as much as you want. Okay, uh, Michael, I, I wasn't sure whether I've got your question right or wrong. Uh, we studied the text. The text is authentic, it is above the intermediate level. We believe that uh, if it depends on the aim of the test. If we are going to use it for over B2 level, upper intermediate and advanced, probably it would be useful. But if we will like to use it for A2, A1, B1, uh, there are some words. Uh, it needs some kind of modification because the readability flash is, is high. And it would be very demanding and daunting for the students whose level of language proficiency is below intermediate or B2 level. It was what all we did in our groups. I don't know how far I have answered your questions. Oh, that's fine. And, and let's go, but let's go a little farther with that. So I, I think actually, um, I, I'm not sure, I mean, you obviously can do whatever you want. I'm not sure that I would try to use this below a B2 or even a C1 level. I think- No, 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 just we were talking in our group, mm -hmm. if anyone, any teachers who would like to use it for uh, below the B2 level, he or she needs it to do some kind of modification. For example, camouflage is uh, an advanced word. Um, or um, grasping or filtration, swooped, curling, mm -hmm. and maneuver, subdue, strangling, peculiarities, seizure, seizure, sorry, compelling. These are demanding words, okay? And we believe that this is something like a uh, language proficiency test, like uh, TOEFL and IELTS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, if if you were working with a lower group, you, you may want to choose a different text. Yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. So for which, sure. So let's say you uh, had a B2 or a C1 group. How do you think you could use this? And who, who was your partner? Uh, there was a lady, Iviri. Iviri. Iviri, great. Iviri, please feel free to talk also. Okay. If uh, I I was supposed to do such a test, I would start with some uh, referential questions, some cohesion coherence questions, and finally some inferential questions. And regarding the I, I would start from the most simplest, the most difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Kabe, if you could just uh, very quickly just scroll down so we can see, everyone can see how long that text is. Just go Probably ahead. 300, 350 words. I'm seeing 775 on the lower screen, but 
If you just scroll, yes. people can get yes, a good idea. True, true, true. Yeah. Would would you would you make this shorter? Obviously, for C1 B2. No, no, no. The, remember, this is a B. Yes, C1 B2. Yes. I Did, don't. I don't make shorter. You wouldn't make it shorter, okay? Okay. As a personal conviction, probably some other colleagues will. Mm -hmm. I believe that it's suitable B2 and above. For B2, B1 and A2, it isn't. Right, right. Okay, great. Okay, anything just, else? Just, just one point, Michael. I'm sorry. Yep. I'm trying to uh, reiterate what I have learned. Uh, normally, randomly, I will do a kind of, let's say, flash ease check with the type of the text or course book I am teaching. Then I am trying to, to, to find a kind of text which is dovetail with that flashes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So what we're, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to start with the authentic and tr maybe modify it if we feel it's necessary, right? To modify it to suit our students' needs. So certainly, even for an upper level group, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe you would want to consider um, either changing some of this vocabulary or maybe asking mm -hmm. them to try to predict yeah, the meaning of some of these, right? Mm -hmm. Using context clues to try to predict the meaning of some of these harder words. Okay, let's go ahead and Susan. I will stop sharing. Yeah, please, please, thank you. Susan, are you... Susan, can you share your screen? And Susan, who is, um, who is your partner? She mentioned she couldn't open video. Um, Moses had them. He's the one who shared the screen. Oh, Mo okay, Moses, why don't you go ahead then? Okay. And please tell us what you talked about. Okay, can you see the recipe? This is the yes. text shows. Uh -huh. Okay, right. so this is for uh, beginners in A1, A2. A2 level. Yes, this is a A2 level according to the CEFR. And I'm gonna just show you quickly so you get a sense of the text. So the picture, banana bread, and here we have the ingredients and on the other side we have the directions so since this is uh targeting beginners we felt that we could come up with three activities to test comprehension the first one would be match uh, the ingredients with the pictures okay yes Mm -hmm. uh, section two would be uh, match the steps and the directions with uh, the picture. And then we also felt that there could be section three and we could ask maybe a couple of questions, but we didn't have time to generate the questions. Okay, it, so it, it, it sounds really interesting. Uh, Susan, do you want to add anything to that? Um. We thought a question would be um, to ask them what you need to prepare before you start making the banana bread. Mm -hmm. You know, like the number of balls, the, what is it? The, the rack, um, other than the ingredients, you know, the tools that they need to use in order to make the banana bread. Okay, okay. When we look at the directions, is there anything I, I'm thinking from a linguistic? I'm not thinking about, don't worry, I'm not thinking about banana bread. Maybe you like it, maybe you don't like it, maybe you don't know what it is. I, I don't know. It doesn't matter. Banana bread doesn't matter. But when we linguistically, when we look at the directions, is there anything that, that jumps out at you? Anything that you. It's, I, as, it's as, as cultural, we, you know, the cultural factor. That's why I thought if we're testing them using this, they must have studied something similar. Okay, okay, because this is very American. Okay, okay, right. So, you know, like the first thing when I started reading is the degrees and their Fahrenheit. Okay, 325, this might, 
they may not understand it. Butter, a nine plus plus inch loaf pan, they may not get it. So I was like, okay, if we're testing them with this, they must have studied something like this. Perfect. Or could we modify? Could we change uh, that to metric? Metric and the idea, uh, yeah, the kind of pan and so on. Right. Yes, maybe metric. Okay. Yeah. So really good point. We, we probably to make this accessible to our readers, we need to change all those ingredients or all those directions to, to metric. And, you know, maybe the, they're not familiar with these kinds of pans. Susan, let me just ask you, um, do you know banana bread in Egypt? Do you know what that is? I know, do, I've been to the States. I work with Americans. I okay, know what people, banana bread is. Do generally people in Egypt know what banana bread is? No. Okay. And, and Moises, how about in Peru? Do people know banana bread? Uh, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> so okay. we can relate to this easily. Okay, great. So, but in Egypt, in the case of Egypt, you know, they, they, they don't know, most people probably would not be aware. So we could think of that as um, a, a problem to solve, or we could think of that as a, a chance to teach some cultural knowledge also, right? We can think about that in both ways. I'm thinking again about the directions. Um, anything, and I, I, I'm asking this basically to anyone now, anything that really jumps out at you about the directions, anything that stands out? Oh, also How to make about... the bread? Well, I'm thinking linguistically. Linguistically. Uh, it's, it's like instructions, even instructions using the imperatives. Um... Yeah. Yes. This is a case in English, I think maybe the only case where we use the verb without the, the subject, right? Yeah. So we, maybe, maybe we could do something with that. The nouns? Sorry, nows in it. Sorry, Nina. Nows, the name of the ingredients that are listed. Uh huh. Select okay. The nows. Yes. Okay. Great. Great. And, Wonderful. And, and then the verbs of the actual um, actions that will be done to prepare the banana bread. Mm -hmm. Great. And Nina, remind me of where you're coming from. I'm an American. Oh, you're in the states. Okay. Yes. So do you know, but, but I think you're from Africa originally? No, I am born in the United States. Oh, I have yeah. my last name because my da dad is Nigerian. Oh, your dad's American. Nigerian. Okay, okay. So you know what banana bread is. I actually make banana bread and eat it. <laughs> okay, great. So, so you're probably familiar. Maybe you have a better recipe. Great. Okay. Thank you, um, Moises. A any last comments before we go on? Any last um, comments? Actually, yes. Um... I have a question, Michael, because I was thinking about the authenticity of the text. Okay, yes, and I was thinking, okay, if I'm reading a recipes because I wanna cook something, okay, so if this is the case, okay, yes, basically when I'm thinking about recipe, can I follow the recipe? And perhaps what gets in the way is the words, the vocabulary, even more than the structures, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so for me, it's the ingredients, okay, plus uh, the verbs, because I need to know, you know, what is to preheat at, uh, I don't know, mix. And so I was, I was struggling to think of an authentic task to test okay, the comprehension. So we gave you two activities but I don't know if you would come up with something else. So yeah, that's, that's a Let great question. Let me jump in. I have a please, comment please, about that. Please, yes. Okay. So I'm going to use an example that um, we had to do for one of my classes in graduate school where um, my professor asked us to um, create a nursing plan with a recipe. And if you're writing a lesson plan that has to do with recipe or how to make something, you have to have the pictures so that the students will see the actual items and how the um, process is being made. So if there's a part where the person has to fry something, you have to show a picture of a pan mm -hmm. so that they can uh, see that and say, oh, this was what I'm going to use to fry this, okay? And then if uh, the actual recipe calls for oil, you have to show a bottle of uh, oil 
So they will see that this is um, oil, what type of oil, whether it's a vegetable oil, uh, soya bean oil, um, virgin um, oil. So these are the things that uh, a person likes to identify because English language learners, um, a lot of them are visual learners. So when they are learning the vo vocabulary that is in the recipe, they also want to see the actual picture, which will make more sense to them. So in the case of banana bread, you have to show the actual bread, what it looks like in the finished product. And okay. then for each um, ingredient that will be used, like the flour, show a picture of a flour so that they can see it. Eggs, show the picture of eggs. Okay, and thank you. If they are going to mix it, show the picture of the bowl that will be used and then mm -hmm. the picture of the wicks. And then under the picture, then you write the actual um, item that they will use it for. Great, thank you, Nina. That's 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 really interesting, and I think Moises talked about using pictures, and I think very, you know, he especially talked about the the ingredients. But I think that's very interesting that we could also, and I think something maybe to keep in mind that we can also use pictures for verbs. Yes, something I think we don't think of sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Moises. If you can unshare, and we're going to move on to Rosario. Rosario, who is your partner? Nina, I work with Nina. Okay, and, great. Uh, maybe I can uh, share my screen. Let's see. Can you see we we, uh, we worked with Document Seventeen Magazine at the B two level, finding the right circle, a guide to choosing uh, friend groups in high school. And uh, I'm going to scroll down to show how long this is, and uh, one of the first things that uh, was mentioned was that we would make it shorter mm -hmm. for B2 students. Um, and uh, maybe uh, include uh, just one paragraph in each section, for example, mm -hmm. to make it uh, more accessible. And uh, if we were to use the passage for a test, uh, some of the things we could do would be to match the, the match a subtitle with a paragraph. Um, we could we also talked about um, uh, using uh, true false statements or in or even uh, questions, open ended questions in which students have to uh, show their comprehension by answering a question. Um, and another thing uh, that uh, we commented was about inserting uh, a statement uh, uh, used as a distractor. So a statement that has nothing to do with the paragraph, like mixing it in the middle for students to identify it and crossing it out. And um, what else? Uh, and then if we were going to use this passage as a teaching instrument instead of as a testing uh, instrument, uh, we would have students talk about the topic first and uh, have them share experiences, then read the text and uh, decide what is relevant to them and what is not relevant and uh, eliminate anything that was not relevant to them. And uh, Nina, I don't know if we, you would like to add something. Yes. Um, one of the things that we um, talked about last before we came over was that um, if we are going to use the uh, paragraph as a, a test, like a comprehension test, where they had to read it and answer questions. You know, have the questions that are relevant to the passage for them to answer. And maybe uh, the very last question, put something that they can, uh, a question that they can answer uh, as a personal reflection uh, based on what they've experienced that is uh, related to the passage that they will, um, like to share. 
Other comments? I, I want to make a comment here that I, I just think Rosario just said some really wonderful things. Um, and I just I just want to point that out because Mama? Mama? when we're dealing, someone's Mama? mother's lost, it sounds like. When we're dealing with these longer texts, right? And this, uh, yeah, when we're dealing with these longer texts, I think it's, you know, it's very likely that students kind of look at it and they think like, oh my God, what am I doing with, you know, and they, they, they sort of get afraid and, and nervous and anxious and, and they don't know how to deal with so much language. And I think it's really nice that this text is broken up by the subtitles or the subheadings, sorry, into these shorter passages. And that allows students maybe at the intermediate level to really orient themselves into a certain part of the of the text. So although I think this might be three or four pages long, but if we're looking at the, you know, the part that's just on the screen now, uh -huh. observe how they treat others. And we see just three paragraphs there, right? So if the student can orient himself and and know, okay, I know it's somewhere in this, it's it makes it it makes it the challenge a lot less and it doesn't intimidate the students so much. So I really want to, you know, point out what Rosario mentioned about those subtitles, sorry, subheadings can really help our students. And one more thing, you know, this is uh, an American, North American magazine aimed at, at the sort of upper, it's called 17 magazine. It's, it's aimed mainly at the upper teen girl market. So for teenage girls of about 16, 17, 18. And it, it really gets into these issues about their everyday lives at that age. And I think if you can kind of draw in that that culture aspect, too, because this is very relevant to, you know, if you're teaching in a high school, this is very relevant to, to that age group. So I think it could be very meaningful. So, OK, other comments, other comments. Anyone? All right, Rosario, you can stop your share. Thank you very much. Sure. And I just want to, um, two, more, two more things, I guess, before we're almost out of time. We tried a, a, a bit of a new format today, um, rather, than, rather than a sort of a lecture format, which is what I, I often do. And I, I, hope those, I hope those have also been informative and meaningful, but we tried a very different format. If you have any comments, if you liked this a lot, if you thought, well, this wasn't really what I wanted, please send me your comments positive or negative, I, I'm very happy to hear what you have to say about this format. Just, you can send them to me in, um, it, it, according to the email address that where I sent you the, the invitation today. Okay. So if you really like this, if you didn't like it, you know, just, just give me a comment. I'm, I'm very happy. This is our last webinar for uh, this academic year. We're, we're going to take a break over the summer. We'll be coming back in September, November, December. We do not have one in October because ELTS has its its annual uh, symposium then, or its annual webinar. Then. Annual so, conference. Conference, yes. Uh, convention. Annual conference, yes, that's right. So we will not be doing a, a, a monthly webinar in. Um, Did you decide on the theme of the conference, Michael, or not yet? So I am not in charge of that. I'm not in charge of that. And I because don't. Because I've got two studies. I was wondering which one I should send challenges of artificial intelligence in language assessment or teachers' assessment literacy and well being. Oh, those are. Said. Those are both yeah. such interesting topics, and I think exactly they're very one, interesting. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, yeah. So right, um, but anyway, I just want to invite you back in. Uh, in uh, breakout room. I'm sorry. Breakout room. No PowerPoint. I just want to invite you back in um, September for our next webinar. So again, thank you to ITEP, the International Test of English Proficiency, for sponsoring this webinar. And in September, we're going to talk about online assessment, okay. and this will be seminar and discussion format. So again, it, it will be sort of a similar format to what we did today. So thank you so much for participating. And uh, dear yeah. Michael, I would like, on the behalf of myself and colleagues, to express my sincere thanks for your precious time and effort you are doing without any expectation, without anything. In return, you are trying to improve our knowledge of language assessment. I 
really would like to express my sincere thanks and gratitude. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kave. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank all of you for participating, for coming. And I hope to see you in September. Sure. Thank you, Michael. It was very interesting. And uh, sharing with colleagues also was uh, was something I uh, particularly liked. And uh, the topic that you're suggesting for the for September online assessment, well, really, I think I'll, I'll be there because I'm I'm really into that too. Oh, Thank wonderful, you. wonderful! And please be sure to 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 come with all your ideas and 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 comments because we want to hear sure. from you. We want to hear from you. Sure. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.